A young man. A terrible accident. Doctors do everything to save him. But the boy is brainstem dead. The boy's father stands by the bedside. The same father who bought his son the powerful bike as a birthday gift. The surgeon has said there is nothing left to be done. The father must now take a decision. The toughest decision for any parent. But the compassionate one for the brain dead boy. Yes, compassion, karuna, the basis of all ethics. The law now endorses it. Passive euthanasia is legal in India. This father can let his child go painlessly with dignity. This father can forgive himself for thinking first and only of his beloved son. Passive euthanasia became a landmark law in India with a powerful judgment delivered by Justice Markande Kachu. This historic judgment places the power of choice in the hands of the individual over government, medical or religious control. We have said that the force of force feed is going to be through the nasal tube. It is going to be done by the and she should, be, uh, she should be allowed to दया मृत्यु को लेकर सुप्रीम कोर्ट ने ऐतिहासिक फैसला सुनाया है सुप्रीम कोर्ट के मुताबिक विशेष परिस्थितियों में पैसिव यूथेनेशिया यानी निष्क्रिय तरीके से दया मृत्यु की इजाजत दी जा सकती है सुप्रीम कोर्ट ने अपने इस ऐतिहासिक फैसले में एक ऐसे कानून को जन्म दे दिया है जिसे बनाने की हिम्मत शायद कोई भी चुनी हुई सरकार न कर पाती सुप्रीम कोर्ट ने ये कहा है की ला इलाज बीमारियों के मामले में पूरी जांच परख के बाद अगर जरूरी हो तो मरीज को दया मृत्यु दे दी जानी चाहिए अनायासेन मरणम विना धैनेन्य जीवनम देहि में कृपया शंभो ग्रांट मी दिस ओ लॉर्ड लाइफ विदाउट पॉवर्टी डेथ विदाउट सफरिंग This true story starts in the city of Bombay in the early 80s. It was told as a cautionary tale from one working woman to another, from a mother, a teacher, to the eldest of her four daughters, then a young journalist. Aruna Shanbag is this 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 young feisty person who came from a very small village in coastal Karnataka on the Konkan belt. to work in bombay in those days everybody saw bombay as the only place where you could come to work this girl made exactly one mistake she was told not to change her nurse's uniform in a particular place in the hospital which she worked in the basement there was a space for people to change and she didn't change there that is the only mistake she made knowing that that is where she would change this particular sweeper of the hospital sweeper ward boy he lay in wait for her and using a dog chain because in those days we had dog experiments experiments on dogs before uh, operations were tried out on 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 human beings uh, using that dog chain he attacked her from behind he wrapped it round her neck and because he was attacking her from behind and wrapping it round her neck he brought her down on all fours and then he sodomized her like a dog and 
this is her eternal tragedy and and i can say that there is never going to be a case like this in the world ever there hasn't been and there will never be while he was twisting the dog chain he was also sodomizing her and the reason why he was sodomizing her was because she had her periods okay while he was sodomizing her he let go of the pressure on the dog chain presumably when he climaxed and in that if he had to just keep the pressure going she would have died instead with the little release of that pressure he left her almost 80 to 90% brain stem dead in that he knocked off her sight he knocked off her speech he knocked off her movement over a period of time man has found ways to intervene to reduce pain to prolong life and in some way there has ended up also prolonging suffering so particularly and as this law now applies it's for those people who are incapable to take a decision who are brain dead in a vegetative state for those people it is very important that this option be there because the very definition of dignity is violated when you simply have somebody alive but not really living death will come when it needs to come if it's about fate but death also needs to be about free will and when i started thinking about all that i realized as i researched you know cases in the world i realized that those who lingered and lingered and lingered were either because there was a question of state which meant that the state was looking after you really paying for everything or estate meaning you had a lot of money either you had a lot of money or perhaps your families didn't have a lot of money but felt obliged that till the time they became penurious over you they needed to look after you it cannot be about state or estate it needs to be about the individual's right to choose more than anything else it needs to be about having the choice so that then you make the choice we didn't have that choice and that is why i decided to go to the supreme court marte hain arzu mein marne ki maut aati hai par nahi aati the 110 page judgment is recorded for posterity in india's legal and medical history the judgment praises the author activist pinky virani it puts the patient above all else and calls upon the highest ethical standards by medical and legal practitioners in the exercise of passive euthanasia in allowing passive euthanasia for brain death and persistent vegetative state for the first time in india the judgment provides complete clarity on what constitutes these irreversible conditions i highly appreciate that the court has seen that there has to be an end to human suffering if the medical world is not in a position for any reason whatsoever to put that human being in good health and the suffering is the only th- fate of that person then i believe that that person should have a right to decide whether he or she wants to live or not and in case that person is not in a position to take this decision then the people who are near and dear ones because when you are near and dear one suffers you also suffer it's equally a case of their suffering now how long this kind of suffering should continue is something which each 
individual concerned has to decide. I feel very fortunate for being a part of uh, this landmark judgment and uh, laying down of uh, this law which involves a very important social issue. But at the same time, um, I uh, get a sense of failure, a feeling of melancholy because we were not successful in uh, helping uh, Aruna. But uh, because of uh, this judgment, now I feel that uh, lots of people in her condition have a chance to choose to die and end their suffering. So that is a, a sort of a consolation. Appa, Shankar and myself went to KM Hospital on uh, Aruna's 50th birthday. Appa was releasing her book in her room. Aruna was there. And uh, what I saw, I did not like. Because again, I could see suffering. She was making sounds like she was a wounded animal. Plus, her hands were all, her fingers were all bent. And it's not a pleasant sight to see somebody like that. Every birthday of Aruna in our house is preceded and followed by a sense of expectation that she might get relief, that she will not celebrate another birthday. And I remember very distinctly around her 60th birthday, which is really a milestone in our culture, the 60th birthday, Pinky getting up in the middle of the night, one night, in complete fright, like almost from a nightmare, her feet, her fists completely clenched, her teeth on the edge, uh, with a very peculiar fright shriek that she has. And it could have freaked out anyone. And when I looked at her, it was eerie, it was uncanny, because I remember seeing Aruna some years back at the KM hospital, somewhere in the early 90s, similarly pale, withdrawn, and sort of pulling out, in a sense. And when I woke her up, woke up Pinky and asked, I mean, you know, consoled her, it struck me that this issue of Aruna's suffering being prolonged beyond a point has sort of taken a very strong roots in, into Pinky's conscience. It was very, very, very hard as a decision to take about whether I should even go because what I talk about now is just a fraction of the thoughts that went through my head. It took me more than a year, well about a year to come to the conclusion on whether I really should take this step or not. By that time I had done my research. I knew that what I was going to do if I did it would be of enormous importance not only to Aruna Shanbag which started the whole thought process, but to my country. To me, this was about individual rights in life, in death. I did not want to make it about a movement because this needs to be a very private decision. This was about passive euthanasia. I was very clear that it needed to be about dignity when you were already at your end stage, not looking for an end stage. Pinky Virani decided to approach the judge behind the prominent Sri Krishna Commission report, which brought to light the horrors of the 1992 Bombay riots. He knew of her work because of her book, Once Was Bombay. When Pinky approached me for a lawyer and told me what the uh, issue was, I was interested in helping her because I was very familiar with Aruna Shanbagh's case, having been a resident of Bombay all my life. And uh, the issue was an interesting issue in the sense this could up, uh, across the board it could apply to any human being in the country and the law was not settled in this country at all. Although there were other judgments which said right to life does not include the right to death and there was debatable issue as to whether euthanasia is permissible, under what circumstances it is permissible or not. So I said, yes, somebody has to represent this point of view before the Supreme Court. And I thought there should be a competent lawyer, and I picked on 
if an erstwhile well junior of mine who has now become a senior counsel and he appeared for uh, Pinky Rani in the Supreme Court. I believe it's a duty of every human being to eliminate human suffering if possible. If that's not possible, at least try to minimize or reduce it. I have undergone a similar experience. I had fractured my pelvic bone and I was lying on a bed for nearly four months, unable to move. Even to get a glass of water, I had to depend upon somebody else. What one goes through in that state of your body is something to be experienced. It's not something which can be translated into words. After 36 years, Aruna's condition did not improve. Even doctors said that she is in a vegetative state. Human life essentially means life with dignity. And I believe that that dignity came to an end in Aruna's case much earlier. When senior advocate Shekhar Nafade came up with this idea, with this concept of the next best friend, it struck me as completely brilliant observation and interpretation of the constitution in a sense. Because here is a person for whom nobody is really standing up or speaking. And here is a constitution written six decades back, which had a provision exactly for that. And that advocate Nafde should pick up on that provision and enable a complete third party. In biological terms, Pinky was a third party. When it was decided that, yes, indeed, we could file a petition into the Supreme Court as a public interest litigation uh, with me as the next friend, I also knew that there would be one of four outcomes. Uh, I would either get passive euthanasia for only Aruna and not for the country. I would get passive euthanasia for Aruna and the country. I would get passive euthanasia only for the country and not for Aruna, or all of it would be thrown out. Well, when I started working on this, I was barely conscious of the fact that this is going to make such a huge impact on the jurisprudence of this country. But as the case developed, I realized its importance. And I thought I must do my best in this case. There are several people across the globe who go through the kind of pain that Aruna must be experiencing. And our judicial world, even the legislative bodies, even the medical world, has not adequately responded. I was basically concerned with the concept of life and concept of death. Whether vegetative state is human life, that was a question which I wanted the medical world and my legal fraternity to answer that. Pinky and I, we have a lot of differences. We, we have diametrically opposite views on a lot of issues. But when we are agree in agreement, we are in complete agreement over issues. And this was one issue where we were in complete agreement. I am in complete oneness with her on this, that a person's life, how it is conducted, should be the person's choice. And whether the person's life should be prolonged and the suffering, what kind of treatment, all these are issues that must be discussed while they are in good health and should be followed, their wishes should be followed up. And in the case of those people who are not in a position to decide, the society, the state must decide what is dignified existence. So when Pinky suggested that we should go to the Supreme Court to appeal for passive euthanasia for Aruna and also for 
the rest of the country, people who are, have relatives in hospitals who are struggling for a solution, who can very clearly see their loved ones suffering and in pain, but are forced to continue with the treatment or intervention because that is what is expected uh, socially, culturally. It is something that uh, doesn't uh, have a solution in the statute. So I said, yes, let's go. The lawyer said I shouldn't speak to the press, to the media at all. I was somewhat in, I, I was actually quite happy because uh, I, I don't like the idea of people speaking and fighting uh, their cases in television studios and in the media when there is a case being held or being fought in court. So I, I like the idea of respecting that. But my God, did I get slaughtered because I was not speaking. And there was nobody else to present my point of view. Uh, obviously, there was nobody to present Aruna's point of view either. Oh my God, I was, I, I was slaughtered. I was called, who does she think she is? I was told, playing God. Uh, against Bharatiya Sabhyata, against Indian culture, was it coming out of this year, this year? It had settled on the pores of my skin. By that time, the whole debate, if you could call it that, had become about, should she be starved to death or should she not be starved to death? Unless we have a proper medical data in that respect, I don't think it is uh, easy to say that uh, starving a patient is good or bad or removing the ventilator is good or bad. In fact, I, lot or little that I know, if you remove a ventilator, see that person uh, may suffer more. I have only one defi definition, like why I would want passive euthanasia, that's if somebody is on ventilator. No other reason, because I can't uh, not feed someone, not pull somebody off medication. I personally cannot do it to my family member. People don't know uh, that even uh, this process of starving a person is a gradual thing. It's not as if you just stop feeding the person and let the person die. So there are, there is a certain procedure and medically also uh, certain procedures to be followed where the person doesn't uh, suffer too much of pain or distress. That television episode where we had the Christian priest and I was getting really angry with him because he was talking in, t in terms of very academic form that oh, only God, God, God has given life and only God can take away life. And you know, and I was getting really angry and saying, you know, we are not talking of this abstract. We are talking of a of a real flesh and blood, warm-blooded person who's been in this condition and uh, who really needs some kind of final dignity to come to it. You know, the dignity of death. The whole thing is really that when you stop having the dignity of a human being, which is the only ju just justification for pulling up blood or stopping a feed or doing whatever. So it's when you have lost that dignity of being a human being, that's when the argument of God and God giving life is no longer valid. My religion tells me that I should try to alleviate pain, misery to any human being. Now, forcibly administering antibiotics or any other kind of medical support to a human being and forcibly trying to elongate the lifespan, is it really going to help the human being or is it going to elongate the misery and pain? That is the debate that needs to be considered. So I do not think religion comes in the way of saying which is the lesser pain that is being inflicted. That is the test. All religions tell us that God is all merciful, God is the judge of judges. Having been a judge all my life, so I know between the two issues that have to be decided, I shall certainly decide and vote in favor of something that causes lesser pain to the human being. And I'm sure God agrees with that. I remember after Justice Sri Krishna suggested that I meet with Shekhar Nafne, who and Shibhangi Tuli was with him. I remember the first time I sat and spoke to them about the whole thing. There was 
complete pin drop silence as 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 he and and Shivangi listened, and I sort of looked at him and I said, "Sir, what 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 do you say?" And he said, "Call me tomorrow." And I called him the next day, first thing in the morning, and I said, "Sir," and he said, "Yes, I'll do it." And I remember shutting the phone and I remember sitting down, and and thinking, "Okay, all right." Somebody finally is going to take Aruna's story to the country, to the highest court in the land. Somebody is finally going to get justice for a woman whom, who doesn't seem to have ever received justice. Of course, when the judgment came, it's not as if she hasn't received justice. She has. She has. It's the court. The court has given passive euthanasia for for every single Indian in that condition, in that irre, irre, irreversible condition. It has also okay. given it for Aruna. But then this is Aruna's greatest tragedy. Those who claim to love her won't let her go because they think okay. that suffering is in her destiny. While ironically, the very law which she has brought for India. Shows very, very clearly that there is such a thing as free will over fate. Aruna. एक स्वप्न पड़े तो बैस लिया लक्ष्य दी दो हाथ बापरी एक लाख बाटी पूर जाली है सदांच बाट अस्ता हाँ हाँ तू गुंत लिया तुगेल वरी सदा ही रान पी चेड़ू हम जेवण बाट तो दिस कुड हैव बीन एनी प्लेस इन इंडिया इवन टुडे एक्सेप्ट दैट दिस कॉन्वर्सेशन टुक प्लेस वेन गर्ल्स हैड लिटल और नो एक्सेस टू द मीडिया वॉट मेड अरुणा बिकम अ नर्स Was it the traveling cinema which influenced her? Amma, mak Miguel pura aish galo jina. Ha mukal varas thornu kama vatta. Ha Bombay vatta. Tu amgel gaon bahir vatse ni. Ani att tu Bombay vatta. Ghanche chili ekli gaon bahir vatse na. Par ha vatta li. Tu itle chandi. Ani goriya sa. Attu ch tu kik lagna chang mangne aile. अरुणा But then, Doctor advises carotid angiography to assess dog chain strangulation damage to carotid artery which carries blood to patient's brain. Patient's sister refuses to give permission for carotid angiography. Says contact brother.
patient's family refused to take her home. Doctors try new method of physiotherapy so Aruna's limbs would not twist further. But her nurse colleagues stopped the physiotherapy, saying patient felt pain. Aruna found on floor. Bite mark found on her tongue. Window found open in her room. Next day, bars put on window. Lock put on door from outside. And so, Aruna locked in and into her own private hell. She would react only as a completely old, ailing house pet, a dog, would react to somebody's voice saying something different. So there would be some sort of laugh, there would be some sort of smile, there would be... She didn't... She, she wasn't even looking at you, she can't see. She would turn her head in this unsteady way, but again, that had nothing to do with your voice, because I would sort of walk around the bed to see if she could follow. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Sometimes when I would go, she would... She would... Uh, she would be in extreme agony from inside. She would be like this. She would be like this. She would... She would... Uh, she would be moaning. She would be whining like, like a little puppy. And by that time, her skin had become like parchment. I've seen the process of her teeth falling off on her bed. I've picked up a tooth and called somebody and said, Dusra daad gir gaya, you know? So if you touched her skin, it could almost tear. But if she was whining and she was in pain, then I would just... And I would sing the song my nani had sung to me, Nani kali, sone chali, hawa dheere ana. And she would sort of soothe. I suspect it was just the touch, not, not the voice. Or... And I would sort of keep in touch with her wherever I went. I worked all over the, really all over the world. But wherever I went, I would keep in touch. I would make sure something, some food went, some clothes went, some diapers became important. As India liberalized, diapers became available for us. So I would make sure that stacks of diapers would go, because otherwise they wouldn't. Then I realized her 50th birthday was coming up. And I did an article. I, 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 I spoke to my then editor, Bachikar Karya, and I said, we have 1947. We've got the 50th year of independence coming up now. But in 1948, on June 1, and within our independence year, because she was 19, born 1948, I said, within this one independence year, there's going to be somebody, there is somebody, who we are just not giving independence to. We've put this big lock on her room. We've denied her of everybody who loves her. It doesn't, the love doesn't matter to her. It really doesn't matter to her. But we've denied her of no. Said we have denied her of sunlight. She has been in that room from the time she was raped. Till the time I was just this jolly journalist coming along and writing these articles, which would sort of ensure that Aruna's room was kept clean and that she was treated like a human being. It was okay, I was tolerated here. Some days I was tossed out, some days I was not. But when I researched the book, and when I realized that nobody, none of her colleagues, none of the doctors, nobody came forward to file the FIR. They didn't even lodge the complaint for the rape. As a consequence, the rapist, the guy who sodomized her, walked scot-free in six years' time. Pinky Virani, supported by her husband, Shankar Ayer, worked at getting Aruna a state-of-the-art medical checkup in a private hospital. They wanted to approach the Bombay High Court with the results, ask for guardianship. Permissions were given by Aruna's caregivers, then withdrawn at the last minute, 
This documentary asked to hear the hospital side, but the dean declined. The Supreme Court said we need to see that everything that you say is the truth. So they wrote to this hospital. This hospital sent back a letter, a one-page letter, which said she is fine, she is hale, she is hearty, her blood pressure is super duper, her heart rate is excellent. When she wants to go to the toilet, she tells her nurse colleagues, and the nurse colleagues escort her to the bathroom, which is attached to her room, which we keep spanking clean. Suddenly, Pinky, from being the next best friend, or the best friend, or the next friend, became into enemy number one, which was, I think I wrote a column about that as well, that I don't understand really what is happening, because uh, suddenly the, uh, you know, the, the savior is being pointed out as the, as the predator. They got this CD. It's actually not a CD. They, they sort of took their little mobile phone in when all these nurses sort of played bhajans and urged her to eat this piece of sugar, which they sort of put on her lower lip. Although she had this tube and everything, and she was like a, a wounded dog in utter pain. That was the sound that was coming out of her. My hair was standing. I could see that the media was like stunned and shocked because here is something that doesn't live and it doesn't die on its own. Here is not even a human and not even an animal. Here is something that is pure twilight zone, you know, the worst kind of twilight zone, the non-romanticized kind. And in the midst of all this, this one young pup of a lawyer, many of whom had come just to be part of this unusual tamasha almost. And this guy says loudly in the Supreme Court, Are yaar, ye to koma mein nahi hai. And after that, when the CD stopped, I went and I, he, that, that, that young advocate must have got the fright of his life. I went and I clutched him, I put all my fingers into his elbow. And I said, I'm the one who's brought this PIL young man. And I have only one question to ask you. Aapne bola na, are yaar, ye koma mein nahi hai. Aap chahenge to exchange places with her? Do you ever want to exchange places with her? Is there anybody in this courtroom? Is there anybody in this country, including all those who don't want her to die, legally die? Does anybody want to exchange places with her? I remember when the case went up, there was one celebrity who sort of said on Twitter that may Aruna live a long life. I said, I mean, where are you going? What's wrong with you? I mean, you might want Aruna to live as, I mean, be there and no intervention be done in terms of a passive euthanasia. But would you want to wish that somebody in that state should live longer and forever? I mean, this is the kind of cuckooness that you sort of are confronted when this issue comes. Unfortunately, could be a decisive factor is that she has become a trophy patient in the sense that she has become, from their point of view or what they would like the public to know is that here's this great, uh, you know, service that the nurses of, of KEM have been performing on this poor woman, their colleague, all these years. So the fact that these nurses have now kind of become so possessive about her is becoming very difficult for them who are now the only authorized people to be told, who can now stand up and say that uh, yes, now please pull the plug because then they're afraid that, oh, why didn't you do it all these years earlier? They will be asked that, you know, really what has changed so much from the time that that law came in and you did not allow it? Why did you allow her to become so, so much less of a human being? So that question will be asked. So perhaps it is in their interest to continue to say no, no, till she dies, you know, of her own. We are not going to be the people who are going to, uh, say, reduce the feed or turn off the ventilator. It may have well become a prestige issue. The politics of mercy in medicine. Those who claim to love her are those who celebrated when the Supreme Court assigned them as Aruna's next friend. 
friends the patient does not know, those who every night go home to their own families. They don't have to pay for her. They retire or move on to other jobs. They get on with their lives. Fame, family, money, all the way till a sturdy old age. And then suddenly, a major illness. With it, remorseless pain, suffering without hope of alleviation. It can cruelly, quickly drain the joy from a life well lived. This self-made and successful actor's family decided to unhook him from the hospital and take him home. Where he died a few days later, peacefully in his own bed. What has never been done before in the history of India since 1947 is that the Supreme Court made this very striking comparison and difference between life and quality of life. And in doing so, it actually has given those Indians who want the choice dignity in death. The passive euthanasia law came as part of a turning point in India's socio-political history. When a violent gang rape fatally brutalized a victim in a moving bus, India's youth came out in full strength for justice. Following widespread awareness about permanent vegetative condition due to the passive euthanasia judgment, the government of India accepted for the strengthened anti-rape law Pinky Virani's submission that the law include a vegetative clause and that the perpetrator who puts the victim in a persistent vegetative state be categorized as a murderer. The passive euthanasia judgment also influenced policy on pain management for the irreversibly ill. In every case, there can be uh, abuse to a certain, to a great extent. So the law per se as laid down is a good law, provided it's not misused. Legally, the law has to follow, you know, keep as many safeguards. It has to err on the side of caution. Because we all know that there are a lot of people with vested interests who want to pull a plug, who want to put, forget about pulling a plug, who want to put away uh, people into a, into a mental hospital because they want to seize the, the property. You know, we know about all that. There are several complex legal, ethical, moral, religious issues which are sometimes apparently conflicting. So in order to take a decision on that, you have to have a decision that is appealing to your conscience in the first place. Because this is not a mathematical solution of a unique solution. This will have as many solutions as there are human beings, human beings whose different experience in life, whose different thinking in life makes them look at it differently. But the complex issues are law, what does the law provide? Number two, what does your religious background tell you? What is in the best interest of the person who is required to be helped? And how do you ensure that there is no abuse of it? I don't want a situation to arise when the close relatives gang up and say, hey, well, let's give him a goodbye so that we can knock off his property. So there should be some safeguarding factor. The safeguarding factor must always be a committee of medical experts and some judicial mind going into it and saying, yes, this is the situation where this kind of a solution can be applied. If all this can be assured, passive euthanasia is welcome. What is wrong with it? We always laugh and, you know, where I say that, look, I want to die at 70. And a friend of mine tells me, yes, everyone wants to die at 70, except those who are 69 and a half, you know. And I'm not that far away from 70, and I, I don't know whether I now want to die at 70. But the point is that, yes, a living will is important. If a living will has been left, then the family will respect that living will and also be freed of a lot of the guilt that is surrounded of pulling a plug. A concept yet to bear a legal stamp 
is that of a living will. A living will expresses a patient's choice of at what point medical intervention should stop. Clearly laid out instructions make end-of-life decisions easier for doctors and caregivers. When it was confirmed that yes, he is suffering from the lung cancer, uh, it did, did shatter me a lot. I mean, I was broken because I knew that last two years we had a very healthy lifestyle. He was doing regular walks in the morning. He was doing yoga after the walk. We were into very healthy food, eating habits. So it really affected me very, very badly. And I was under depression and I was crying. I lost weight. I was, I mean, I was extremely upset, you know. And, uh, but he was very strong, you know. He's an amazing person, you know. The more I'm getting to know him, the more I'm surprised and the more I'm falling in love with him at this age, you know. He's such a wonderful human being. So he caught hold of my hand and he said, why are you worried, you know? We had such a good life for 49 years. We have to go one day, one of us first and the second person will follow. Whether it's me or you, I mean, you are also 70. You can go before me. I can go before you, so why are you unhappy about it, you know? Let's be happy for whatever days we have together, you know. When the diagnosis was confirmed by my doctor, I told her that I don't want to go through the pains and things. I've had a long enough life. I'm 78 now. We have a happy family, happy life. It doesn't matter if I don't have much more time to live. When this problem came up, the first thought was, oh, let's take him to USA for the treatment, or let's take him to Bombay, you know. He's, immediately he said, I do not want to go anywhere. I don't want to go to USA to add another extra year in my life, or six months more for my life. I do not want all that. I want to be, I don't want to go to the hospital also. I want to be in my home. I want to be around with my family, with my grandchildren, my garden. I want to sit here and go peacefully from this place. I'm now in the process of preparing such a living day. I think it will help my family to take the right decisions. Frankly, I don't know whether I can plan on leaving a living, living will. I haven't even uh, thought of writing a dead will. God forbid if I uh, end up in such a situation, I would definitely like my near and dear ones to uh, make use of this law. Well, I really haven't thought about it. But now that you have put the idea into my head, I think I ought to work on it. I don't think there's any dispute on the fact that I am opting for passive euthanasia. Obviously, if I'm in a persistent vegetative state, God forbid, I mean, you know, just withhold food. And if I'm on ventilator, stop ventilator, don't have any more medicines, etc. Donate all my body parts, including skin. I think this film is my living will. I think whoever sees it, they'll know exactly how I feel about end of life. <laughs>